So my name is Melina Hill Walker and it's a pleasure to welcome all of you today to this inaugural symposium on race and equity in New Hampshire. We were amazed at the turnout. We had 200 and were thrilled. We felt the time was right. We didn't realize how right the residents felt it was. There were a lot of young people here that informed those with more entrenched views of a new reality. White ignorance. What do you think that term means? We're going to talk about that it. That behavior has been increasingly emboldened in our country. Something's going on here that, that needs to be addressed. So if we're going to have a healthy New Hampshire, we have to have environments that don't have all these social circumstances in it that hold some people behind and create inequities. People were feeling more emboldened now to do what they always wanted to do, but just didn't know that there was the support there. So good morning and welcome everyone and Happy New Year 2019. <laughs> Your six work groups have formed. I thought it was brilliant. It was people discovering where they were, what they could do, what they felt empowered to do, what they felt afraid to do. How does this economy actually serve uh, people of color? How do we create access? How can we identify those barriers and how can we can make a difference in removing those barriers? In government, it's extremely important that our policymakers hear from impacted people. So yeah, we have a great group of folks from all across the spectrum of health. And we're really looking at the social determinants of health, which are huge contributing factors for how people experience wellness. So the group I'm a part of is the education group, and we have an amazing collective of people really assessing how do we develop a plan to become more successful in meeting the needs of all the people that they serve. We are part of the law enforcement criminal justice team. Obviously, this has been in the news quite a bit lately. The systemic history of the disproportionate incarceration of people of color in our country is of paramount importance. There's so many different organizations around the state who are working on civic engagement and working on race and equity. So we want to understand who those organizations are, map them, see what they're working on, and see where there are gaps or see where there might be a way to connect these organizations. And understanding how your biases could actually be impacting people on a personal basis day to day. Eight years ago, I and I think a number of people looked at New Hampshire and said, this is a totally white state and uh, why would anyone spend much time or effort or, or treasure uh, on dealing with with equity. I remember uh, sitting in my friend's dorm rooms and looking at yearbooks and actually seeing, um, going through their yearbook and I'd be flipping through and I'd, you don't have any black people that go to your school? Like what's going on with that? And, there, and it'd be from New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine, Massachusetts, Connecticut even. We don't know what we don't know, right? That we, we have a feeling that there's not enough data. We don't know what data exists. We don't know where to look for it. Our job is to figure out what data we need to be looking for. For the majority of my students coming in, they've never had a person of color even as a professor. And so I'm that first person that they, and, it, and there's a difference. They don't understand. So it may be where as I'm talking, I'm having conversation. For them, it becomes, he's aggressive or he's angry. We certainly have been seeing more and more incidents. The whole thing in Dover, mm -hmm. at the Dover High School, mm -hmm. the Laconia, Claremont. The Claremont incident. There's been several things that have been coming to light. So it's not a minute too soon for us to begin this conversation. Mm -hmm. We have to recognize our own biases and prejudices and racism and train each generation to say, this is not acceptable. You know, you can't make a perfect plan from a book when it comes from equity. It's really about understanding how people have lived in the world. It's about understanding how people are experiencing the world right now. And it's about understanding what our biases are. Because what we're really planning for is helping people relinquish biases they don't even know they have along the way. You're meeting for the third time. Progress to date is promising. 
from a review of your workgroup folders, they have some really interesting discussions that have taken place as you work to complete your action planning document. We're going to synthesize the, what came out of the breakout groups. And really do a critical analysis. We're going to look at it, see what themes arise. And once we do that, then you can really come up with a very intentional and specific plan about how you will move forward. Thank you for joining us today to participate in Symposium 2.0 on race and equity in New Hampshire. With more than 440 people registered for today's symposium, still having to tell some people, I'm sorry, we don't have enough space. That's pretty amazing, don't you think? Without quite knowing what the end result of their work might be, these volunteers devoted their time, talents, expertise, and commitment to a process. I would like all the work group members here today to stand so they can be recognized. Please stand. We're now inviting all of you, as members of the broader New Hampshire community, to engage further in this process as we review these draft sector action plans. What's happening here today that I'm seeing is people engaging in conversations across differences and about differences. And that's not something that happens all the time. Work has been done. Um, within these different work groups and your job if you didn't work on it is to provide a good analysis and to provide some good feedback. You know this is a conference on race and equity um, so it doesn't center whiteness it's centering race. And that conversation about race needs to happen uh, with, um, with white people. We are using something called ouch and oops so if someone says something that you find just kind of troubling to you, you could say, ouch. Then you have an opportunity to correct yourself, okay? Oops, and then you correct yourself. We're not here to engage in criticism. We're in, here to engage in critique and co-creation. When I in, interact with white people around these kinds of topics, what I always hear over and over and over again is, I wish I had more opportunity to feel comfortable talking about this stuff. Because we've taught white people to be afraid. You know, be afraid of messing up, be afraid of saying the wrong thing, be afraid of being uncomfortable. And I want people to understand that discomfort is when you start to learn something new. The whole problem with racial inequity in this country and with racism and structural racism and even individual racism and the inherent bias we all carry no matter what because we grew up swimming in this sea of racist attitudes it's never going to be solved unless white people grapple with it and what's happening at least in the worlds that i inhabit is that we now see what has always been happening. I don't think people of color are at all surprised by all the videos and all the news. I think that they have always known. But at some point we have to say, all right, and it needs to stop. Courage is the ability to do the thing that must be done even though it terrifies you to do it. And we all have to be courageous because the ask for the last 200 years, in my opinion, has been asking people of color to lead the work to support the work, to drive the work, to unpack the work, to then explain to you what the work is as we're being traumatized doing all of the work. That's what it feels like. That's what it is. And I don't think it's any shock or surprise that one of the number one killers of people of color is heart attack strokes and high blood pressure. It is traumatizing just to be. The United States is a remarkable country. And it's the only country that has its origins in diversity. We certainly had our share of conquests, the, the white eradication of the native nations, for example. But we have built a country that 
has this amazing diversity that we're struggling to manage. We're struggling to figure out what does that mean? What does it mean to be American? And we still are stuck with being an American means being white, being male, um, being blue-eyed, being Christian. And yet our country is more than that. I've had the privilege of living in countries where democracy was not the rule of law, where authoritarianism, uh, you know, despots, uh, and, and, and those countries thrive at the whim of one individual. Here in the States, in order for us to avoid that happening, we need people involved in our democracy, our participatory democracy at, at all levels. And so I think these kinds of conversations are really, to me, essential to becoming American together. This is really an indication, I think, of a growing awareness in our state of the importance of race and equity. If we don't learn how to live together and we don't learn how to respect each other, what's the future going to be? And if nothing else, the Endowment for Health spends its time saying what is the future in New Hampshire of the programs that we support and the, the ideals that, that we espouse. I encourage all of us to consider what new opportunities and wonderful possibilities may lay ahead as we jointly add our voices and actions towards next steps in addressing race and equity in New Hampshire. Thank you.